Uh, my message today is greetings and love displayed. The whole book of Romans is about love and unity. And in the spread out through there is about salvation. So I'm going to read some things. And when I get through some of this stuff, I'm going to skip. Although I got 27 verses on the calendar, I'm not going to try to do all 27 verses. So y'all understand that. I'm trying to get through the book of Acts, the, I mean the book of Romans, the last, last part of it. Although many times the book of Romans is used to share gospel, salvation, it always points to unity and love. I believe, I believe this is so important because God loved us first and sent His Son to earth to show us how to love and share our faith in love. Why would anyone want to become a Christian, want, want to know Christ, if we don't li live life with love and unity? You understand what I'm saying? Why do people want to follow us if we're not showing love? If we're not unified? Chapter 16 is more about those who did Christ's work and not necessarily those who would be considered the heroes of the faith. I hadn't really thought about that before. But you know, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about the heroes of the faith. And at the end of that, somewhere close to the end, it talks about, and there were others. These were others. These were people that, that did things in Paul's life, okay, helping Paul, helping spread the gospel, that are really... One or two of them are in other parts, but for the most part of them, they're only listed in Romans chapter 16. And they really just got a little brief sentence about them. They're unknown. But there's, it's personal expressions of love and affection for other believers. And that's what they showed, and that's what Paul was saying. They're regular, everyday believers, and they point out like the book of Romans, unity is a natural response to the gospel of Christ. The close of the book starts with unity, acceptance, love, obedience to God. The, great, the greatest commandment and the great commission. The greatest commandment. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and the foremost commandment. The second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law of the prophets. See, love, 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 and share. Mark 16, 15 says... And he was talking about what they needed to do. And Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's what God's called us to do. Not just the preacher, not just the elder, but all of us are called to go out and share the gospel with people we come in contact with. Another place in the Bible says, as you go, share your faith, share the gospel. That's what we're supposed to do every day. But yet we fall so short of it, including me, we fall so short of it. That's what this message is about. First slide. Servants of the church. Are we servants of the church? Are we servants of the gospel? That's the real question. Are we servants of the gospel? Do we share our faith? Do we live our life in such a way that people want to know the reason for our joy? The reason that we don't get bombarded or down in the dumps when we get bombarded. What do we do? How do we live our life? That's what's important. The verses 1 through 15, 
I'm on, are workers for Christ. Paul is recognizing them for their help in spreading the gospel. They are like many of us today. I may not say all the names right, okay? In fact, I'm not even going to try to say half of them. Because I can practice, 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 and by the time I get up here, I forget what I practiced. I'm not even going to try to say them. But what's important is the people in our lives, what Paul is ta thinking about, what he's talking about. The first one is, I commend you, I commend you, our sister Phoebe, the servant of the church. You know, what happens is, is they were talking about all of these people that were in the church. Paul was talking about all these people that were in the church and doing things for the church. In my life, I could put Mary Height here. Y'all don't know Mary Height. But Mary Height was a lady that was at first or at Bellevue Baptist Church that when we walked in the door with four little girls, she grabbed those four little girls and us and wrapped her arms around us and squatted down on the floor and talked to each one of those girls individually. She showed love immediately. She was a servant in the church. She was reaching out to the kids. Mary Height now is sitting in a nursing home in Carthage. And all she knows today is to hold a little play doll. Her whole life was spent loving children. That's what she does. But she gave her whole life loving children. And, and she impacted us. Debbie didn't know I was going to use her name. She impacted us over 40 years ago. And I still remember, I went and visited her at the nursing home about three or four years ago. Another one was Miss Condor. A lady that loved people, loved kids, reached out. I can't count the meals that she fixed for my family. Okay? She was a servant. Now, I can go through all these names in here and mess them up, but I'm talking real life. We have people in our life, our real life, that have affected us, good or bad. We need to hang on to the ones that have affected us good. Prisca and Aquila, fellow workers of, church, of, the, of Christ. The ones truly most that made the most sacrifices. I thought about Ken and Jan, family that I stayed with this weekend. We haven't seen them, and except for last time we saw them was Daddy's funeral. I hadn't seen them. We got separated for so many years. But you know, when we sat down and talked to them, they were such an encouragement to us. They encouraged us. They they uh, spoke into our lives, and they were important to us. Others that I've thought of, and I'm not going to go down all these lists, all these names here, because it's, it's a bunch of verses. But uh, Ken and Jan started a church in their home. Okay? Started a church in their home and in their dining room. Okay? Now they have a church of about 250, 300 people. Okay? Why? Because they're servants of Christ. Because they do the things necessary to grow the church. A lot better preacher than me. But his dream was a little different, I guess. He started when he started preaching in 1982. And I pre started preaching nine years ago. You never forget the ones that stayed faithful. Ken was kicked out of Mid South or Mid America Seminary because his wife walked out on him. He stayed faithful even through that. He stayed faithful even when everything was going against him. Do we stay faithful when everything goes against us? 
That's the big question. Stayed faithful. Brandon. The next verse says, My kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Brandon is in jail. The last count was 23 or 24 people that he's led to the Lord since he's been in jail four weeks. We've taken him Bibles. We've taken him material to encourage him. And he called me yesterday and says, Pastor, I sure want you to come see me. I said, Kevin, I mean, I said, Brandon, I tried. They won't let me in. He says, I'm going to see if they'll let you come see me. He calls me every single day. Now, what's that do to me? That encourages me. See, that's what we're supposed to do is encourage other people. So I'm not going to go, th like I said, I'm not going to go through all these names. But Brandon, converts. My beloved. I put down good old Ron over here. I love the guy. I can call him any time. And I'm, if I forget you, not your name, it's nothing personal. Okay? I'm not trying to pick out certain people because I went down through a whole bunch. Of, I put down everybody's name and then I thought, well, I might forget somebody and they'll hurt their feelings. So I, I, I marked off a bunch of names this morning because I thought, sure as I do, I'll forget somebody. <laughs> but Ron... I know He loves me. I know that I can call Him and He will give me an honest answer, number one, but He will help me in anything I need. Okay? That's what we're supposed to have is people that we can depend on. A fellow worker. I can do that without getting in trouble. Mark. Mark came to our house to live. He took mowing the grass away from me. He took a lot of the maintenance stuff away from me. Now, that's stuff at my house. But Mark, if he sees somebody that's in need, guess what he does? He jumps right on board. And he takes care of it. That lady that called us, what, two weeks ago? I more or less have forgot about it. He talked to her yesterday. Okay? Wanted to make sure she's okay. See, that's what God tells us to do. Let's check people. Mark Gall, another pastor. Remember two weeks ago or a week, three weeks ago, I brought in these Bibles. I bought in a whole case of Bibles. We didn't have the money, or we had the money, but I just couldn't see us spending that much money on Bibles. He gave me those Bibles, no charge to the church. Every year, Mark Gall holds a pastor's conference. And he invites people in to do that. Nobody knows this. I'm going to say it right here, over, right here on the air if I have to. Mark Gall, five years ago, I said, or three years ago, I said, Mark, I would really like to have a men's conference or a couples conference in Jackson County. Okay? We got a lot of distractions in Jackson County. You know what his first response was? Brother Bobby, if you do it, I'll give you $3,000 to do it. I will pay up to $3,000 to take care of that. Now, is that a brother in Christ? A man that's never been in this church, but he knows what this church is doing? That's what... God means when he, we talk about these people. James Estes. That's one way back, isn't it, Mom? The man that led me to Christ. Okay? Roy Gingrich, the pastor that I had my, most of my life, most of my childhood, young life. Harold Ross, the one that I just did his funeral last week. Adrian Rogers. Jerry Creel, the man that married my wife and I. All of these people had influences in my life, specifically. You've got some people in your life that have influenced your life. Okay? 
One that's well known, Adrian Rogers. People say, well, why can you go to the church? It's so big. I had a personal relationship with Adrian Rogers. We would walk to his door at his office Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and he'd kneel down in the floor and talk to my daughters. I could go to his office any time and talk to him. That was a man of God. That's what we're supposed to be as children of God. We're supposed to reach out. Adrian Rogers, John MacArthur, Tom Darty. Tom Darty was probably the best friend as a pastor we ever had. Because he was not only our pastor, but he was real. He, he would get out there and work with us and do things with us and go places with us and always building into our lives. That's what we're supposed to do is build into other people's lives. Not just come to church on Sunday morning and forget about God the rest of the week. Wayne Wells, I shouldn't have said Tom Darty. Wayne Wells was later in my life. <laughs> Somebody that I'm not even supposed to associate with according to religious theology. My best friend. Cried many times with him. Talked to him many times. Would share scripture. Would share all the things in the Bible. Nothing was off the table when it came to talking, talking to Wayne Wells. These are people that had impacts in my life. Ministers, youth leaders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, piano players. And like I said, I, I purposely, I mean, I can go down here and start talking here, but I might forget something. So I took all those off. Randy Hetty and Kelly Stockton. I meet with them every Tuesday morning for breakfast and prayer. Now, do we agree on everything? No. But we have that brotherly love, that spirit that ties us together. That's who we're supposed to be, is people that love God and love other people. Now, I've got other people in my life that aren't Christians. I don't discount them, but they're not as close. Ted Jernigan's a, a great Christian brother, okay? Bill Taylor, I've known since the ninth grade. Y'all don't know them. But they know that I, I can call them, or I, they can call me anytime. Paul's ministry, all these listed made an impact in Paul's ministry. Do you make an impact? That's the point. Are you making an impact for the cause of Christ? The last one on my list, and it's because of verse 13. Rufus, a choice man of the Lord, his mother and mine. But Paul was saying that. And when he said his mother and mine, it wasn't Paul's natural mother. But he had that mother image of this lady. And I put down Mal Ross, Brother Harold's wife. Her whole life, we called her Ma Ross. Because she had that impact on our lives as, as kids. See, we got those people in our lives. We need to recognize it. We need to show people. We need to talk about it. We need to love them. The last part it says is, uh, is talking about all the saints. And it probably, you know, so many times the Bible just talks about the men in the Bible. This talked about women also. People that were important to Paul. Next slide. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the church of, churches of Christ greet you. Holy kiss. Kissing, a brother, kissing brothers and sisters on the forehead, on the cheek, or the beard was customary, especially for believers. That's why I'm a big hugger. Everybody knows that. Bill's a good 
big hugger and a good hugger. Okay? We are supposed to greet people with love. It's not necessarily a kiss. It's not necessarily a, even a hug. But we're supposed to greet people in love as Christian brothers and sisters. If you walk in and somebody... you got to ask a few questions. you got to ask a few questions. Do they love? Some customs like kiss, kissing still in effect today in other countries. It's the same for today as a handshake, a hug. It's very important to show love, acceptance, and appreciation, especially to new believers. Don't be standoffish. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody like Darren told me this week. If you're a new Christian or you're a struggling Christian or if you're a Christian that don't dress right or smells a little bad, if we stand, if we turn our backs on them, why should they be part of the church? Why should they be part of Christianity? You know why? Because somebody's going to show up and show them love. Do we want to send somebody away because we didn't love them? I put, many today don't feel welcome in some Christian circles because they don't dress right, they don't talk right, they don't act right, and they may have made bad choices. We all know people that make bad choices. What are we to do? We're to love them. The ones that have made bad choices that aren't Christians, will they ever become Christians if we don't show them love? Think about it. We've got to love them. It's our duty as followers of Christ to love everyone, even the ones we don't like. Does anybody in here have people they don't like? Come on, be honest. It better not be the preacher. But we have people that we don't like. Thanks for that. <laughs> Even the ones we don't like. I've talked to more than one person that feels rejected by the church because of past actions, appearances, whatever you want to put in there had a young man come to our house several years ago that came to our house crying because he had visited a church in the area and because he did not have a new shirt and new blue jeans on, he was turned away at the church at the door. That's not God's way. Go in the hedges and byways and compel them to come. Is everybody going to be in the hedges and the byways? Got their new clothes on? Are they going to be rich? No, because they're, they're slaves usually, right? In the Bible, compel them to come. We can't ever be part of that group. Next slide. Hold on to love and reject false teaching. I'm not going to read the verses. I'm going to paraphrase it because of time. Greetings in love should be cautious of harmful, harmful, false teaching and practices. And practice that turn you from the truth of the gospel and thereafter the church and foundations of God's work. Love will forgive wrongdoing evil. Love or forgive evil. But do not condone it. Well, don't condone it. Don't welcome it. Don't accept it. Or even ignore it. If something is going, if somebody's doing something wrong in the church, we can't ignore it. 
we have to confront it, especially if they're teaching something that is wrong. We can't, you know, I, I get beat up all the time because uh, um, I don't agree with some people. Okay? But I've had to change my legalistic process and what I believe. As Christians, and only if we truly love other believers, will stand out and teach them and warn them about false doctrine and things that will harm them. We cannot sit on the sidelines if we are true believers. I can't sit on the sidelines and accept Joel Osteen's teaching. I wasn't going to put that in there. But I can't sit on the sidelines and accept that. Yeah, he's a good preacher, but he's not preaching God's Word. He's preaching another gospel. And there are others that we know of that do that. A study recently, this, this blew my mind. My cousin gave it to me this weekend. A study recently that came out said, the church today, listen to it closely, and I hope I say it right, 60 percent of attending evangelical believers who profess to be Christians believe all religious ways lead to heaven. In other words, the Bible's not true. This is so-called believers, in my opinion, of God's Word. I know people that believe that. My brother believes that I am arrogant because I said that Jesus is the only way. The Bible says I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Part of your I am's, Gary. The Bible says I am the bread of life. It just, I am that I am. I mean, it's over and over and over. You're doing John, but they're all the way through the Bible. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. See, the I am's. He's the only way to heaven. You're not going to get to heaven by any other way. You're not going to get heaven by praying to somebody else. You're not going to get to heaven because somebody else forgives you of your sins. You're only going to get to heaven if you're forgiven by God Himself through Jesus Christ. That's a fact. Now you can take it and do it. You can turn it any way you want to. But that's the truth. And if that's not true, this whole book is false. So let's stand on God's Word and quit playing games. Quit playing tiddlywinks. 60%. Did you hear that? 60% of the church-going people believe there's more ways to heaven than just through the blood of Jesus. I can't, I can't fathom it. But it's real. People are dying and going to hell because we won't stand up. Well, for what we say we believe. The first 17 talks about the, the dissensions and falsehoods in the church. Verse 18 talks about the appetites of the church, self-interest and gratification, flattering speech. I'm not standing up here to flatter anybody. If I can scare you into hell, I want to do it. Or into heaven, I want to do it. I scare you into hell. You're going to hell if I have to scare you out of it. I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent and what is evil. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. Romans 1.8 says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. 
are you proclaiming? Faith is proclaimed throughout the world. Be wise of what is wise and what is good and innocent of what is evil. The God of peace will, cu will crush Satan. You know, one day Jesus is coming back. But you know what? In the book of Genesis 3.15, it talks about G uh, Satan being crushed. He will be crushed in the book of Revelation. There will be no more Satan as we know him. He can't mess with me. He can't mess with you if you're a Christian. He can try. But you got God on your side. That verse says, He shall bruise your, you on the head and you shall bruise his heel. Next part of that says quickly, uh, soon. Are we to sit back and wait for something to happen in the church? Do we sit back and wait for something to church happen? Come get, get up quickly is what that verse says. We're supposed to get up quickly and do something. Are we doing something? Next slide. Encourage, help others. I oh, love encourage. You left off a word, sweetheart. <laughs> encourage, help others to participate with you. Verse 21 and 24 through 24, and I'm not going to read all those either. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. And so does Luke, Lucius and Jason and Sophia and my kinsmen. We are to help. We are to participate with others in ministry. Not just Sunlight Church. If we see another like-minded congregation that's doing something, we should be ready, willing, and able to participate and help. The men's conference is in February, by the way, guys. They're giving me a day. It's in February. We will attend, or I will attend. I hope the men will too, okay? And we will participate in it. I've been to five, five meetings at Washington Avenue Baptist Church. I've gone to Lighthouse Christian Camp more than once for a pastor's conference. Now, those are just those things I do. But when I say participate, if Randy Hetty has a revival, I will participate in that revival, whether I'm speaking or just attending. Brother, you don't really understand. I ain't got time. We all have the same amount of time. It's just the choices we make. We participate in other ministries, not just our church. But with other churches, we do a good job with missionaries. We do a good job with missionaries. Lighthouse Christian Camp, CPC, and, you know, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. We used to be real active in that. I've spoke there a couple of times without the church being involved. But we're supposed to be participant in that with our church family. We're supposed to participate in the lives of our church family. Now, some of you are so private, you don't want nobody to know nothing. But how can we participate and pray for you if we don't know what's going on? Think about it. Thank you, Ashley, for calling us this week. It meant a lot. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And not me particularly, but I helped in it. We had Fellowship of Christian Athletes there Tuesday morning. We had, we've been there last Tuesday that I'm involved with every week. And I'll be speaking down there before long. Howard, the jail ministry, Samaritan's Purse, rehabs, food closets, clothes closets. Not just as a church, 
but as individuals. And we're good at it. I'm telling you, don't back off. Because that's sharing God's love further than what this church is going right now. And sooner or later, it will be honored and people will start showing up. I put Coach King on my list here. I, again, I put Mark Gall, Scott McKinney, other church leaders, other things in our community. Howard, look at what Howard's doing. He's not just doing here and bases. He's going across the country. Stay true to God's Word. Last slide. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation and the mystery which has been kept secret for so long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandments of the eternal God must be made known to all nations. We're supposed to reach out. And we are. But it's just not putting your money in the, in the plate and chest. We don't do plates anymore. It's putting your money where your heart is. Uh, to all nations leading to obedience of faith to only the wise God through Jesus Christ. Everything we do, everything we are, Everything that we will be is supposed to be to glorify God. If we're doing anything we do for anything other than to glorify God, we're not doing what God's called us to do. That's what we, that's what we are allowed to do through Jesus Christ as we point others to Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that is which is good and acceptable and perfect. The next verse tells us to preach the gospel, to win people, to, to win souls, to point people to Christ. Always be ready to give an answer to the hope that's within you. You have heard me say that over and over and over over the years. Always be ready to give an answer to the hope that's within you. The next talks about... Uh, making known to all nations. We are supposed to spread the Word of God. Home first. Our city. Tony Evans did a long time ago, and I can't say it near as good as he or as fast as he. But the way to change the nation starts in the home. And you start in your home with your family, your kids. And then your, then your next door neighbor and then your community, then your city or your region, and then your city, and then your county, and then the uh, county regions that you're in, the group of regions, and then half the, half the county, then the rest of the counties, then the state, then the nation. That's what we're supposed to do. We can't solve the nation's problems by ourselves, But we can solve things when we put God first and we start in our homes. Remember the thing I read a while ago about 60%? Guess what? Those were probably kids that were raised in church. And they got confused by the educational system. And the church wasn't there to support them. 
Where are we at? And when you make it known, there will be people that are obedient to the faith. The last verse says, to the, to the only wise God, through Jesus, be the glory forever. Amen.